So thank you and welcome everyone. It's um, delightful to be here and I really want to thank the Ronald Reagan Institute for putting together all of these panels. Um, it's been an amazing conference so far and I hope that you'll enjoy our conversation today. I think in many ways um, what we're talking about really does, um, not to use a pun, connect with the prior panel, um, but connectivity is important and I think what we're going to be discussing today is really transformation, right? How um, are schools and districts and states transforming now in the wake of the pandemic? What sorts of activities and programs and initiatives have been undertaken at the local and state um, level and the national level as well to try to rethink um, education and help more students get to what they need, both in terms of things like um, opportunities for careers and helping to bridge that skill gap, also in terms of how do we get young people to be reading and doing fundamental skills like math as well. So with that, I think what I want to do <coughs> is just um, start with this idea of what it means to transform uh, the school experience. And I'm hoping that we can kind of go through the grade levels, if you will. Um, I think it's, it's easier to think about our system when we sort of move from um, kindergarten up through 12th grade and then out into the workforce. So I'm going to actually start um, with Mr. Blackwell here. Uh, who has made an incredible um, app um, that's all about making music count. And really what this is about is helping young people understand math through music. Um, I think it's an extraordinary achievement and what I'm hoping you can do is talk about this idea of how something was extracurricular and how it can become a tool to understand uh, the crucial. Yeah, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as I just mentioned, my name is Marcus Blackwell. I'm the CEO and founder of Make Music Count. We're an online tutoring platform that's centered around our patented uh, math curriculum and app that's taught by playing your favorite song on the piano. And as you mentioned, uh, we had to start off as extracurricular because oftentimes when music is involved with learning, it's seemed as playtime. And so the only place that we could go and work with students was after school programs and, and boys and girls clubs. And as we did our work there and started showing the, the math improvement, uh, we started being taken a little bit more serious. And, um, and I mean, you know, our curriculum ranges from second through 12th grade uh, student learning, um, everything from fractions to algebra and even calculus. And, you know, it's like, it's hard to place calculus in playtime, but sure, we'll, we'll do that and we'll start there. And you know, we're just really excited that uh, we were able to show real results you know, in math improvement and math confidence by using something outside of the box like playing the piano. Absolutely, and do you think, I mean, maybe I could just ask this follow on. Do you think that students are more attracted to the math just because the music really helps them? Or do you think the music breaks down the math? Where do you think sort of the, the critical component is in bringing these things together for most students? It's a couple of things. You know, music is really a, it's magic. It's a superpower. It makes us all feel wonderful. And so first, it's bringing that feeling towards approaching math learning first. Uh, but then secondly, when what's really most important, what we're presenting is a real cultural responsive approach to learning. You know, um, I've said earlier, like students, uh, are able to are able to be what they can see, and when you see yourself in a lesson that focuses on maybe your favorite song, you're more inclined to to give it a shot. So you know it's it's uh, breaking down intimidation. You know, bringing happiness to a subject that may not always be presented as something that's joyful, and and then uh, of course representation in that lesson. Fantastic, and um, let's move on to Dr. Brumley. I I think one of the things that's extraordinary about what you're doing 
in um, the state of Louisiana is you're really bringing together a resource and a tool to help combat learning loss and to help um, teachers and students and parents right, find ways to reconnect um, and re-engage with learning in the wake of this pandemic. And it's not like Louisiana hasn't had some experience with this, right, given Hurricane <coughs> Katrina or other massive disruptions. Um, so maybe you could just share a little bit about um, what the state is doing and what you guys have proposed. Yeah, so not only have we faced the global pandemic like everyone else, but in the state of Louisiana, uh, over the last two years, we've faced two of the strongest storms to ever hit the country yeah. uh, in Hurricane Laura and Hurricane Ida, knocking out over a quarter million of our kids uh, for a period of time. Uh, one of the things I, I often hear people say is, uh, how soon can we get back to normal? Let's get back to normal. And, and my approach to that is, like, if we are in a rush to get back to normal, we have missed an incredible opportunity to innovate in education moving forward. Um, and so I think about what are our obligations and what are our opportunities. And I think that we certainly have both in, in this moment in time. And we have to make sure that we are capitalizing on the opportunities that are available to innovate uh, and certainly the obligation we have to better serve our kids and our families and our communities and, and our, our states um, and the country. Um, one of the things that we knew uh, is that we had to do what we could, po everything we could possibly do to uh, get everyone moving in the same direction around a, a, a few core ideas. So our team worked and, and we thought about what are some high level opportunities that we have in the moment uh, in order to, to move forward beyond the, the pandemic. And so we decided to create what uh, we call uh, Louisiana Comeback. And Louisiana Comeback is an initiative that also uh, provides an interactive tool at louisianacomeback.com where, where you can select every parish. In Louisiana, we have parishes, not counties. And you can look at their data pre-pandemic and then our first set of data in the pandemic. And so you can see the level of learning loss uh, at that site and at that tool, you can also look at the amount of federal stimulus dollars that have been made available to every uh, system in our state, both traditional public and public charter. Um, and most importantly, I think what you find at that site is we asked every system across the state uh, to really invest in three key, key areas. The first being attendance and well-being. So making sure kids are physically present and that they're well, whether that's mental health, physical health, making sure that their health needs are taken care of. Uh, the second part being a sophisticated plan around uh, learning recovery and then quick acceleration. Uh, and then finally, giving teachers the professional learning experiences that they need and deserve. So we, we focused on those three key areas. And we also provided a financial <coughs> dashboard so that the public can go on uh, and look at uh, the, the, the ways in which these systems are spending their funds uh, with a certain level of granularity. So we will soon release uh, our first set of, of, of data uh, in many ways post-pandemic. Um, and so we're really looking forward to, to seeing what that says, having that information. Uh, and, then, and then we look again at opportunity and obligation from that information because the data is going to be really good information for us uh, to make policy decisions, make resource allocation decisions, and frame our conversations and relationships moving forward. So just going back to where I started, I, I really think a rush to get back to normal is a mistake. It is a missed opportunity to innovate in education, especially in a state like ours where we have been long challenged with educational outcomes. And so we have to do everything that we can do to get better in the moment. Yeah, I mean, I think the last panel that was here really had an opportunity to talk about, <coughs> you know, reimagining what a new sort of system could look like. And I do think, you know, this sort of charter school movement or reimagining rural schools, thinking about new technologies um, are all going to be incredibly important. I know, um, Dr. Bromley, your, your office has worked um, some on a social studies curriculum. Is that correct? So maybe you could talk about yeah. how you've tried to reimagine uh, yeah. what it is students learn. So I'm, I'm, really, I'm really proud about this, and uh, it, it really excites me. So. Uh, I'm not apologizing for the smile on my face around this topic. <laughs> um, look, we, across the country, like 10 to 15 percent of our kids are proficient in U.S. history by the time they graduate. It, it, it's awful. And we should be embarrassed by these numbers. 
um, you know, taking on social studies standards uh, in the political climate in which we all live today, uh, we knew it would be a challenge. But we also knew that our social studies standards for uh, history and civics and geography and economics lacked rigor. Multiple studies had pointed out that, that we lacked rigor. And if we looked at across content uh, of English and math and science and social studies, we talk a lot about our reading numbers. We talk a lot about our math numbers. But, but the truth is our lowest numbers for proficiency are in social studies. And so we believe it all starts with a, a high-quality standard for our kids. Uh, because once you have high quality standards in place, then you can look to curriculum, then you can look to staff training, uh, then you can look to resources and assessment, but it has to begin with a high quality standard. And so we approached this with the idea that um, we wanted to include uh, voices from across, across the story. We wanted to present the story of our state and our country in a coherent way, um, and, and we wanted to, to increase rigor. We also didn't approach it from a radical <coughs> ideology. Um, we said we wanted a freedom framework uh, that would share the story of our republic uh, and how we were an exceptional nation from the beginning, but at the same time, um, we, we have had moments throughout the course of our history that haven't been great, uh, and, and we have to constantly strive to be that more perfect union, and we're not there yet. Um, but we wanted our kids to understand their responsibility to, to sustain, to improve, to defend the republic in which we live. Um, and the obligation that they have to make it better, and the obligation they have to make it a more perfect union every single day. Great. So um, let me turn to Lieutenant Governor Foley. I know you've been spending a lot of time in your state thinking about how you then connect to careers, how things move for students, not <clears throat> just uh, to college, which I think is a, the traditional sort of thought process or path, but how also to address those skills gaps, how also to make more young people aware of all of the opportunities that actually exist in the workforce. Yes. Well, thank you, Dr. Brown, and thank you to the Reagan Institute for inviting me to participate in this forum. You know, when I received the invitation, my first question was, what is the Reagan Institute? Because <laughs> I'd never heard of it. And uh, I've learned a bit more about it now, and I'm just fascinated by it. I think it's an extraordinary organization. And, just honored to be included in this forum. Anyway, uh, you would, if you knew my career path, you'd probably say, that's a career politician. <laughs> and I'll wear that badge with honor because it's been a great ride. And I've served two terms in our state legislature, two terms as Nebraska State Auditor, and now two terms as Lieutenant Governor. And in that capacity, because I'm not an educator, I don't have a background in the educational establishment, I've looked at educational questions from a different perspective. In Nebraska, like every other state, you've got to balance the budget. When I came into our state legislature in January 2001, they assigned me to our Appropriations Committee. It's a committee of nine state senators whose job it is to write the state budget. There's a lot of competing demands on public funds. And by the way, at the end of the day when the dust settles, the budget must be balanced. We don't spend money we don't have. And we have a lot of needs. We have a correctional system that's vastly oversubscribed. We have too many customers in our, <laughs> in our prisons and a horrible prison overcrowding problem. We've got road systems that are inadequate for our state. We're trying to lure companies to come to our state and bring high paying jobs with them. That, that, that costs money because you have to have tax credit programs to bring those companies into our state. And then you've got the educational established saying, we need more too. So we've got to filter through all of this and write a state budget that's in balance. And some of the big ticket items that we haggled over on those, at those committee meetings in our appropriations committee was how much money do we spend on K-12 education? Nationally, I've been told that the, our country spends about $750 billion on K-12 education. I don't know if that number's right, but it sounds like a big number. It sounds like it could be right. I'll buy it. <laughs> and um, you know, if you, if you started with that $750 billion in a, in a whiteboard and designed an educational system, would it look anything like what we have today? I suspect it would not, and that's true in Nebraska as well. We, we write a check every year in Nebraska of about $1.3 billion in state aid to our K-12 public school systems. That money gets divvied out to 240 public school districts in tiny little Nebraska, 240 public school districts. Why do we have so many? Again, if we had to start over, we wouldn't do that, but it is what it is, 
And politics being what that is, you can't change those very well because little towns don't like losing their schools. And some of those little towns are diminishing in size and scope and so forth, but they want to hang on to their schools. They're desperate trying to hang on to their schools. So we have to make this all fit. What's most troubling is I see in our larger cities some of the low-income families. Their kids are just not getting there educationally. In the more wealthy communities, sure, they've got choices. But in those low-income communities, they're not getting there because they don't have school choice. And this is a tremendous problem. Nebraska is one of the very few states, very few, that does not have any school choice. It's kind of like the old uh, saying from uh, Henry Ford when he was selling Model Ts. You can have a Model T in any color you want, as long as it's black. And we tell low-income families, you can have any education, any education you want, as long as public school. Because you can't afford an option. And that's not good. That's not healthy for the process. And as I said, there's so many kids coming out of those schools, they're not prepared for the workforce. They're not prepared to, to, to earn a living, to, to have families of their own and build a future for themselves. That's very troubling. If you even start to have a conversation about school choice, or even start to have a conversation about charter schools in Nebraska, there's a little organization called the Nebraska State Education Association, and they will be on you like a, and squish that like a bad bug. Because they don't want to hear anything about choice. They don't want to hear anything about charter schools. They want public schools only. I've got six kids. I know the importance of education. I've got three grandkids about to enter school. One of my daughters is setting up a classroom right now. She's about to engage in the, the, uh, the wonderful world of teaching sixth and seventh graders math. <laughs> and I wish her well, because it's, it's, it's tough. It's tough being a school teacher these days. <laughs> I don't think I could do it, but she's going to go for it. But lots of challenges facing us. And, and one of those big challenges is just resources. And as a policymaker, I'm one of the guys who has to make those decisions. How much money are we going to put into education versus road building, versus prisons, versus we've got 250,000 people in the state of Nebraska who are tapping into various programs in our health and human services. They need basic human services to get by in life. We've got to fund those programs. It's all very difficult. And education is a critical, important point, uh, a part of that calculus. If I could add to that. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think first of all, I do not have six children. Uh, I, have, <laughs> I have two teenage boys, and I hope I don't have any grandchildren as far as I'm <laughs> concerned. That's the best part. <laughs> um, in the future. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, OK, all right. I look forward to that. Um, no, I mean, I think coming out of the pandemic, one of the things we realize is that parents, parents demand and deserve uh, choice. They do. And, and they want to pick the modalities in which their child will be educated. And, and we as you know, bureaucrats, or whatever you might call us, policymakers, we have to realize children do not belong to the government. They belong to their parents. Yeah. And um, moving out of the pandemic, I think that we should be expanding opportunities for choice, not limiting them. Uh, and so that's what we will continue to do within our state, whether it's our, our traditional neighborhood schools, which overwhelmingly that's where families want their child to be, in a good, solid neighborhood school. But at the same time, we need to look at other options like uh, our public charters, uh, non-publics, home schools, learning pods. Uh, the, the more we can personalize that experience and understand that there has to be flexibility in education. A child may want to go to the building two days a week, and the parent may want them home three days a week. I mean, they're just, we have to, we have to think through how we personalize the experience for every single family uh, in our state and across the country. I couldn't agree more. You know, March of 2020, when the <coughs> pandemic rolled into our state, the kids went home from schools. Some of those kids never came back yeah. because the, the parents realized, hey, I can do this. I can teach my kids at home. And I don't have to deal with gender ideology. I can teach religion. I can teach morals, and nobody's going to stop me from doing that. And they kind of like that. And they, they kept their kids home. Homeschooling took off big time in Nebraska because of the pandemic. We had some, but it really took off in a very serious way as a result of the, 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 the pandemic. Yeah, so let me just also turn this back to um, Mr. Blackwell. I think um, what's interesting is you've filled a need in a new modality which can be incorporated anywhere, right? At home, um, in an after school arena, um, students can just do it on the bus. I mean, you know, it's a really kind of open minded um, transformation of education. And I think, you know, what I'm hearing too is, is the importance of rethinking, right? The, the place, 
the time and the calendar that has always made schooling so hidebound. Um, I mean, it's shocking to me as an educator um, that you know we're still operating on an agricultural calendar. Um, you know, the industrial revolution did happen, <laughs> and yet we are still <clears throat> there. We're now in a digital revolution, so there's so many more opportunities. So maybe you could just also talk about learning loss and how you've plugged in. Yeah. Um Goodness, we saw a tremendous learning loss in, in mathematics, and um, one of the things that, you know, the silver lining of the pandemic for us was that uh, p teachers were desperate for creative ways to get their, their kids into their online Zoom classes. And they're like, look, we need anything that'll just allow them to join, and that opened up an opportunity for us. It's like, hey, you know, we have a non-traditional approach of learning math that'll include some music, so if you're open to that, they're like, yes, please bring that in, and the students would join, and and then they would see our math improvement as well. So, wait, you're actually helping them with math. Like, yes, that's what we were trying to tell you before, but, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, get your foot in the door any way you can, and, um, you know, we've been able to successfully um, start to rebuild uh, that foundational math piece uh, that was lost during the pandemic, and you know, it, it was really interesting that we were talking about, you know, choice. Um, and I think that we should open that up to students' choice as well for how they want to learn. You know, because, um, you know, what we've seen is, you know, students are enjoying our platform so much that they're not just asking, hey, can you put my favorite song in, but can you add this type of math mm -hmm. that will help me as well. And, and that's, that's huge. You know, what student asks for more math? Not many. <laughs> but, but they will, and, and they just let us know that, you know, we should be open to more options uh, to teach these different types of subjects. Now, have you thought, and maybe you do this, and I'm just not aware of it, but do you have sort of um, skill certificates that go with each <laughs> class? I mean, I'm curious because a couple panels ago, mm -hmm. there was this big conversation about, you know, skill-based certification and what that would mean for people as they go to approach a workplace or what have you. So we don't do that for our K-12 students, but we were thinking about that for uh, the online tutoring platform that we have for college students. Um, if they were to accomplish uh, foundational aspects of math, that they'll be able and eligible to teach and earn revenue through our own online platform that's taught specifically around Make Music Count. So that is something that I believe in. I think that is a great idea, so we're, we're looking into that. That's great. And so let me just open this up to all of you. As we think about um, college, the cost of college is, I think, far too expensive. Um, and yet we tend to focus mostly on tuition. There are also other aspects right, of the cost of college, whether it's moving away, whether it's the living costs, whether it is um, sort of all that goes with uh, kind of taking three to four years out of your life, sometimes five years, um, mm -hmm. to <clears throat> complete a bachelor's degree. Um, and I know, Lieutenant Governor Foley, you in Nebraska have been working a little bit on sort of accessibility and rethinking that college readiness. We have. You know, uh, for many, many years, our governors and lieutenant governors and senior policymakers, we did everything we could to convince every single 12th grade student, you've got to go to college. If you want to get ahead in this society, you've got to go to college. You've got to get that four-year degree. And we pushed it as hard as we could push it. And we worked with the colleges in our state and other, in, uh, other colleges uh, in the surrounding areas and, and uh, brought them into Nebraska to high school, college nights, and we'd, they'd make presentations to the kids. And we'd bring in people to teach the parents and the kids how to fill out the FAFSA form and said, don't worry about borrowing that money. It's all going to come back many times over. Just borrow it. You'll be, you'll be so happy you did down the road. Well, what happened? You know, that might have been great advice for a lot of kids, but it was really bad advice for some kids because they weren't prepared to go to college. And they spent five or six years, as you said, Dr. Brown, trying to earn that bachelor degree in a field of study that really wasn't going to pay off down the road. Nothing against sociologists, but how many do we need? You know, <laughs> and a lot of kids, and I, and I, and I, again, I don't want to beat up on this. It's a great profession, and they, some people need to pursue that and do it really well, but not so many. 
And political science might be another example uh, where, you know, it's fun to study political science, but there's just so many career paths in political science. Um, so anyway, I think we did a disservice to a lot of kids. We're rethinking all that now, saying, you know, not every kid needs to have that four-year degree. We have community colleges. You can learn some great skills with great paychecks at the end without borrowing so much money. And uh, there's some wonderful career paths available to those kids if, we, if they just, if we just expose them. So anyway, we, we came up with something called the Developing Youth Talent Initiative. When we got into the schools, in the elementary level, and certainly in the, in, the, in the high school level, and took kids for bits of time out of the classroom, take them out in the workforce, and see what's going on in high-tech manufacturing. It's not your grandfather's manufacturing companies anymore. These are clean, smart businesses with robotics and computerization and mechanization and so forth with great career paths that kids don't know about. 100,000 Nebraskans went to work today in high-tech manufacturing. It's a big growth sector in our economy. We're building everything, the lawnmowers, the jet skis, the subway cars, center pivot irrigation machines, and all those companies are begging for workers. And our kids, many times, don't know about those jobs. And if they saw those jobs, they'd, they'd be attracted to them. They'd want to pursue them through maybe a community college program and maybe a four-year four -year degree program down the road. But, but to push every last 12th grader into four-year uh, college or university, not a good path, not a good plan. And we've learned from that. And we've hurt some people along the way, unfortunately. Dr. Brumley, um, maybe you could share a little bit about what's happening in Louisiana um, yeah. from both the affordability and, and as well as accessibility and readiness. Yeah, so first of all, I, I laughed at your, um, your comment about the uh, school calendar. So uh, our, our legislature passed a bill that prevented the Department of Education from mandating a calendar to local school systems. And, and the reason I think that happened is because I was talking too much about year-round school. So yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was using those words too many times, and um, that, that landed in the media too much, and so they passed a law that would prevent that from happening. But uh, truly, we, we have a very supportive legislature. Our legislature is, is very education-friendly. Um, to, to your question, though, I, I think about this in three different ways, but the, the, the way I would frame it is our, our students should essentially graduate on May 15th, and on May 16th, they need to be prepared to do whatever that thing is for them that's next. Um, and so for us, we think about three different ways. One, and, and I'll start with, with college, we have a great partnership with higher ed uh, in our state. I meet, I meet monthly. Uh, and key leaders on my team uh, meet monthly with our commissioner of higher education. We try to stay aligned. Louisiana Department of Education is responsible for birth to four, all the daycare centers across the state, as well as K-12, and then higher ed is under a different office. So we try to stay aligned, and we are very aligned. I'm, I'm thankful for that relationship. Um, but in, in terms of college, we have to do a better job of being deliberate with the handoff. If, if the student graduates again May 15th, there should have already been a relationship established with colleges prior to, the, to that date. And one of the ways that we're trying to do that, not only through AP and IB and those types of things, but th is through dual enrollment. Mm -hmm. And we believe that um, if, if we can make a connection between our kids and a university before graduation through opportunities such as dual enrollment, they're more likely to attend that college uh, afterwards. There's, there's a lot of debate around rigor of AP and IB and dual enrollment is, and which is better and blah, blah, blah. And we can have that conversation. But one of the things that I think is often neglected in the dual enrollment conversation is just the access that it affords. For some students who may otherwise not have access, it's an access opportunity that leads to something down the road. So uh, in terms of, of college, we have to be more deliberate in the handoff. When I think of careers, I, I, I echo the comments in, in that we have diminished the value of career and technical education for way too long. Uh, we have told kids you're lesser than if you don't go to college. Yeah. Um, and, and we're not going to correct that culture overnight. But I think one of the ways that we can correct that culture is to show examples to our students in our, in our middle schools and our high schools of individuals who have vocational careers or, or crafts careers and how well they're doing. And, and let them tell them about their work and tell them about the opportunities that work provides them. And so we, we are um, launching efforts around internships and apprenticeships and high-level credentialing. Because I think even in credentialing, we have patted ourselves on the back for way too long saying, good job. But the truth is, it's like good job preparing someone for a career for poverty. 
It's like, what, what are we doing? Like, we need to be talking about higher level credentials for every child and making sure that those are opportunities available in the high schools. Not by adding additional courses, but by substitution of courses. Um, because that's the only way that that can happen, particularly in rural communities. You can't say, go take these 25 or 24 credits in your high school experience, oh, and go do this. There's not enough time in the day. You have to look at substitution opportunities, and so that's why we're trying to personalize the, the high school diploma experience in our state. And so the third area is just service. There are some students who are going to want to leave high school and go to military service or religious service or other service opportunities. So we have, um, we have bolstered our community service program in our state, uh, and it actually allows for students to earn a, a community service endorsement on their diploma if they complete a certain amount of community service hours uh, during the school year. So we're trying to be thoughtful around all of those three areas of preparedness for May 16th for every child. Yeah, I mean, and I think I'll just add that I think there's one other handoff that is really important um, because I sit on the other side of it. And it is actually from college to career. Um, I, as a, as a director of a graduate school, um, see students graduate from college and say, great, I did this. I am now able to do anything, and I have no idea what I want to do. And there's sort of a drop off between their sort of general liberal arts skills and breadth of knowledge and a sense of how does that translate into career um, or maybe into a graduate um, degree. But I do think that it's the exposure problem, right? I mean, as much as um, this sort of harkens back to a couple other panels, as much as it's a skill gap, it's also an information gap. Um, I think most young people have no idea the multitude of jobs and careers there are in the world. Exactly. And I think all of us grow up thinking you can be a doctor, lawyer, banker, I don't know, maybe Silicon Valley executive or influencer, but beyond that, it's pretty limited. Yeah. And, and I do think it's incumbent upon all of us who are sort of engaged in education to help students say, I promise you, there's, prob there's a place for you in the world. Yeah. <laughs> can I, yeah. can yes, I add there? Please. You know, I think one thing that we haven't really talked about much that we should is, you know, the opportunities that are available now because of social media yes. and technology. And I'm glad you're saying that, you know, it's important to establish that relationship before it's time to go to college because a lot of these kids now, if they get a couple, you know, followers, million followers, they're now making revenue from advertisements. And college may not seem as something that I may want to do. I've already, you know, changed my family's life from, you know, uploading certain types of content. And I think that we may need to start really thinking about um, updating our curriculum to say, hey, there are now careers. Maybe we need a degree in social media content or something, right? Just so that it can be relatable so that there is a smooth transition because, you know, for a lot of the kids in, in the schools we work with, they are on YouTube and TikTok and doing very well for themselves. No, that's right, right? <laughs> because there are these opportunities. I mean, the, the technological world has opened up yeah. um, opportunities, not just, I think, up and down um, sort of the age range, but also the geographical um, locations. Yeah. So we have just a few minutes left, but the one thing I'd like each of you to do is, is take a moment to just kind of blue sky. If you could do one thing that would significantly, significantly transform um, an education system that you care about, whether it's K-12 or what have you, um, what, what would you like to see done? Yeah, I'll, I'll start um, making it mandatory for curriculum to be culturally responsive. The importance of students seeing themselves and building that self-confidence to believe that they can do anything truly that they want to do starts with seeing themselves in the curriculum that we ask them to learn. Okay, um, I could have let you you go, and it will give me more think time. Okay. <laughs> but, but I'll go. Let me do that. Me I'll, I'll go. Um, I'll grab it. So I would say, <laughs> I, would say um, I would say the relationship between families and parents. I mean, families and schools. And I, and I don't want to define a family, but I'm talking about some unit uh, in the life of a child to support them in some way. And, and, and maybe that does or does not exist. Um, but 
helping support that relationship between the family and the school so that it's more productive and that those two units can work together in a better way. Because typically we all know if we have a family and a school pulling together in the same direction, there's going to be positive outcomes for the kid. And so the more so that we can then figure that out, I think the better off we're going to be. And, and the other thing is schools have to be amazing during the 40 hours a week that we have kids. But there's another 128 hours in every week where the kids are in the communities. So oftentimes people will ask me, what can we do? What can we do? We're not in education. What can we do? I said, well, if you're in philanthropy, think about those hours after school. And can you support opportunities after school for kids, whether it's, I won't name organizations, but supporting those organizations that do that work. Um, and if you're someone that doesn't have that resource, do you have a resource of time that you can give? Can you be a mentor? Can you do these things? Can you offer uh, tutoring to kids? And so I think that, that if we can help solve for this, this family school dynamic, um, I think that will go a long way. And when there is the absence of, of that family, if, if we can help create support opportunities uh, in the evening for those kids, I think that that also would go a long way. There's an entity in Nebraska that I hope you've heard of. It's called Boys Town. And um, there's, in fact, there's a movie made about Boys Town featuring Spencer Tracy and Mickey Rooney way, way back when, uh, way before your time. But anyway, boy, when you get sent to Boys Town, it means you've had a really, really tough life. You probably were raised or tried to be raised in a family that uh, was drug infested, methamphetamine is the drug, drug of choice these days. Uh, you probably flunked out of, so to speak, foster care placements. You might have been through ad adolescent detention programs and didn't work out. You may have even been in a correctional system in Nebraska. And then they say, you're going to Boys Town. Boys Town now takes girls as well because there's some really tough situations there. And Boys Towns had to rethink their whole model for helping these young kids. Um, in the old days, uh, you could take these kids, give them structure. They live in family arrangements and cottages on the campus of Boys Town. They got good meals. They had structure. They went to school. They developed those, those talents. And then many of them, the boys in particular, many of them went on to the military, which was also highly structured. And then when they got out of the military, they had that personal maturity. They were ready to take on the world and succeed. Well, we've gotten so good at using psychotropic drugs on kids that are troubled that the military no longer wants a lot of these kids anymore because they're, and, and Boys Town tries to weed them, wean them off of that, but they, 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 can, they can only do it to some extent. And the military is saying, you know, not so fast. We, we're not so thrilled about taking in these kids anymore. So Boys Town had to completely rethink their educational model. They tore out some of their classrooms. They brought in an auto mechanic shop. They brought in a welding shop. They brought in cul culinary arts and other uh, trades and start teaching kids about plumbing and elect uh, electronics and being an electrician and so forth. Things that parents might ne not necessarily push their kids into, auto mechanics and electronics, really. But there's some great jobs there with some nice paychecks. And those kids are thriving. They, they've, they've got their structure. They've got their family life squared away. They're off the drugs. And now they've got some real life skills. They can go out in the marketplace. You might not want to be a welder for the rest of your life. But it's a pretty darn good paycheck right now as an 18-year-old kid. You know, you can pay your bills with that. You can go buy a nice car if you're a welder. And then down the road, as you get more maturity, you might think about, you know, I'm doing really well at welding. Maybe I want to go back to school and study business and start a welding company. So it's opening up a lot, a lot of new doors. And, and Boys Town's completely rethought their whole model of education. It's working very well. Well, thank you. Um, thank you again to the Ronald Reagan Institute. I appreciate this conversation, and I'm sure we'll continue it at lunch. Yes. Very good. Thank you.